Well, hello there, everyone. So glad you are joining us today for this second in a series of educational safety leadership webinars brought to you by Caterpillar and Caterpillar Safety Services. I'm Rusty Dunn from Caterpillar's Enterprise Communications team. It is a privilege to be with you moderating today's session and uh, welcome to all of you from around the United States and from around the world. We know that in the construction industry and the trades, a lot of safety training is um, put around the physical aspects of it, as it should be. But also, what about the safety culture you want to establish? Um, what about the mental health awareness that you should have? Those are other two important pieces of the puzzle. And that common thread throughout all of those pieces of the puzzle is communication. And that's why we're here today. And it doesn't matter whether you work uh, with or for a small business, medium business, large business, whether you are a, a job site uh, supervisor, uh, you work in the warehouse uh, as a manager, you might be the CEO EEO, or the COO. Um, communication is critical for having this safety culture. Um, our first webinar talked about the psychology of safety. Um, helping you as leaders better understand employee behavior. So with better understanding should come better communication. And that's why today we are putting the focus on a communication strategy around safety. So what are those things you need to do as a leader to create and sustain a strong safety culture, um, not just through your words, but through your actions and deeds day in and day out. And we're going to give you some tangible advice, some practical uh, tips, the, the ways that you can apply some of these um, communication um, rules. So that brings us to introducing our speaker and facilitator for today's session. She is our subject matter expert when it comes to communications and putting together a communication strategy around safety. My friend and colleague, Abby Fansler, who is a senior safety consultant with Caterpillar Safety Services. Abby, it's always great to see you. Better when it's face-to-face, -face, but today, social distancing continues to be the order of the day. So great to see you. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you, Rusty. It's good to see you too. And you know what? I appreciate the opportunity to use tools like Facebook, YouTube, Microsoft Teams, whatever it may be to connect uh, in these days. As a communication professional, I always feel like more communication is better. And I have to tell you with some people on my team these days, I feel like we're more connected now maybe than we've ever been because of some of these tools. You're right. We're paying more attention to how we communicate, how often we communicate, and we're gonna take that down a couple of levels today. So we're really excited to have you here. Um, as we get into this, uh, we wanna remind everyone watching and participating today, your comments, your questions during this session are welcome. I know, Abby, we're gonna have to kind of stay sharp. You have a couple of exercises that you're gonna take us through to sort of um, get us thinking, get the juices flowing on those things that we should be doing to communicate in a more clear, concrete way as leaders um, at our business or company. So we're excited about that. But first I might ask, Abby, if you could uh, sort of set the table a little bit, give us a little bit of your uh, background as a senior safety consultant for Caterpillar Safety Services, uh, and then we'll get started with the presentation. But talk a little bit about what it is you do and how you got here. Sure, well, I work on a team of professionals that primarily work outside of the Caterpillar company. We work out with Caterpillar customers for the most part, helping those organizations along a journey to safety culture excellence. And so from a communication perspective, I have the joy of getting connected with these customers at the outset of these journeys and getting to talk with them and understanding what their culture is like at that point, and then working with them throughout their journey. So in many cases, this is a a multiple year relationship that I build and my colleagues build with these organizations as we facilitate culture change. And that's done through involvement of employees at all levels of the organization. So again, I have the pleasure of working directly with leaders. And when I say leaders, I mean those people who have a leadership title. As you mentioned, Rusty, this could be CEO, this could be plant manager, um, this could be any type of role in which you're supervising people. But I also consider any Anybody a leader, anybody who has some influence on those people around him or her. And so I work with a lot of 
loader operators and machinists and people like that as well. And I find there are a lot of leaders in that group who are um, primed to take on some of the tactics that we'll discuss today and utilize those to improve safety communications in their organizations and in their relationships, which then in turn enhances the safety culture in the organization. And so and Abby, really where, oh, go ahead, Rusty. No, and I just might mention as the next 45 to minutes to an hour, You've got some great information in here. I want to remind people, and this is important, they may want to get their hands on that presentation and see some of these slides. So um, they will be able to access this presentation on cat.com slash safety leadership, cat.com slash safety leadership. There's also a QR code um, that will be available as well. So with that, we'll let you get off and running. Sure. Thanks for that note. So Caterpillar Safety Services has surveyed thousands of people across hundreds of organizations across the world over the years it, through a safety perception survey. And we find some interesting data as it relates to communication in organizations and then relates to safety culture. You might not be surprised, or maybe you will be, that more than 95% of survey respondents say that their organizations actively encourage them to work safely. Now, of course, that's done through communication. So most employees say they believe their organization wants safety and they actively encourage employees to work safely. But from there, we dig in a little deeper and we ask questions about for example, how often do you have regular contacts with your direct supervisor about safety? What we find is the yes answer uh, dramatically reduces from there. Many fewer employees say that they have conversations on a regular basis with their supervisors, their leaders about safety. And then from there, we ask questions like, well, when you do have those conversations, how often is that safety conversation positive in nature? And that's really where we see the numbers dip even further. And what we found over the years is yes, organizations believe safety is important, but we also have a lot of work to do in how we convey that through our communications day in and day out, through our words and deeds. And so today what I wanna do is I wanna focus on some tactics. I wanna talk about our opportunities day in and day out to have conversations about safety. And I think what you'll find is they're everywhere. You just have to consider them and then think about the best way to show up to those opportunities. And you know, when I have conversations, start the conversation about communication um, in the organizations that I work with, I sometimes start with this question. You ever bite your tongue? The answer is usually yes. We've all done it a time or two. In fact, 37 years of experience now chewing and eating, I bite my tongue a lot, unfortunately. Um, do you ever, Rusty, did you want to weigh in there? Yeah, well, I was just going to say, yeah, it happens all the time, <laughs> sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis, depending. Right. But absolutely. I think something we all have in common, no doubt. <laughs> no doubt. And maybe this one, too. Do you ever stub your toe? Most of us have experience moving around, right? Uh, but from time to time, making that bed or whatever it may be, we still stub our toe every once again, once in a while. And gosh, does it hurt when we do it. And I bet this is some, one that we can all relate to as well. Have you ever had a communication breakdown? Rusty, how about you? Ever had one of those? <laughs> well, whether you're talking about day to day, week to week, month by month, all of the above. And it's even, well, and it's even tougher now uh, Abby with having to work remotely and we're connected virtually hard enough sometimes face to face but um, perhaps even tougher on some days uh, doing it virt trying to communicate virtually Oh, that's right. Yep. When the Wi-Fi goes out <laughs> these days, that's a real problem. And absolutely, you can have a communication breakdown. And so we've all experienced these things. And what's crazy about it is that these are things we do all the time, right? So we're always eating and, and moving around and we're always trying to communicate every single day. So with so much practice, I got to ask, how is it that we fail so often? And the answer is right there in parentheses. The fact is, psychologists tell us, we aren't thinking. We aren't really thinking about these things. And that's because our brains are very conservative entities. What I mean by that is brains are inundated with information constantly. And there are so many things going on driven by the brain 
for example, you're chewing, you're walking around, you're communicating, that the brain has to conserve its energy and to focus those things that are dangerous or important or really uh, need to be at the forefront of our mind. So what it does is it pushes these routine uh, actions and activities kind of to the background. Can you imagine how much, um, how taxing it would be on your brain if you had to think every time you took a bite and chewed or uh, said, you know, fine when somebody asked you, how are you doing in your day? These are just things that kind of happen without really thinking about it. And indeed, about half of our actions daily actually are occurring somewhat unconsciously. And so, you know, as it relates to communication, I think of one that I commit a lot, and that's as my husband or my kids are running out the door for work or school, I'll say, be careful. You know, and I, as a communication professional, had to stand back one day and think, you know, well, is that an effective message? I mean, good intention for sure. Of course, I want them to be careful. I want them to come back home to me and be safe and all those things. But could I have a more effective uh, comment as they're leaving? Maybe it's to watch out for deer at a certain time of year, you know, whatever it may be. Could I be more specific? Uh, but the fact is that that has become such a routine communication in my day that I don't think much about it. So today what I want to do is really talk about, let's put some more intention, some more thought and deliberation into our routine communications so that we can be more effective. And I like to, um, it, it, because the fact is these things are happening on autopilot. And know what, how, it oper how a, an airplane operates. Of course, you get into the air and you're cruising altitude and the pilot hits that autopilot button. And as you know, most of us know that then the pilot, the, the plane is basically flying itself. And this is what's going on as well in a lot of our safety communications. And for an example, you might think about um, starting your meetings off with a safety moment. This is something that happens in a lot of office environments, right? So you're going to have a regular meeting. Maybe it's a quarterly business call or it's a weekly production meeting and you want to have a really strong safety culture. And so you've built into the agenda. We're going to start every meeting with a safety moment. Again, very good intention, right? This is how we integrate safety into every conversation. This is one way that we do it. But over time, what you might find is that that conversation may not always be relevant to what's going on. Maybe you're scraping for things to talk about. Uh, maybe you have this feeling like, yes, we have to do this because this is a part you know, of who we wanna be, but it's just kind of something to get through before we get to the real part of our discussion today about finances and production goals and things like that. And so I would challenge you to think about ways to make that conversation more valuable. Maybe in more of an industrial or a work environment, it might be an example like this. I work with a road construction company. And so I started asking the employees about when their routine opportunities to talk about safety would be. And they mentioned that they every day before they start work, they have a daily huddle. Excellent. Okay. So is safety a part of that conversation? And they said, yeah. Uh, so tell me how it plays out. And they say, well, you know, we have a checklist that we have to go through and the foreman kind of reads through that and maybe ask a couple questions and people kind of nod their heads or, you know, there's not a lot of interaction. Um, but, and then we all sign the paper and we go off to work. Okay. So my next question is, well, is that an important part of your day? Do you think that communication opportunity is important? Oh yeah, sure. They say that that's an important time to talk. And I say, well, tell me this, is it time well spent as you really think about how that plays out? Does that impact your behaviors through the day? Is it motivating? Is it positive in nature? Is it again, time well spent? And that's when they say, you know, not really. It's, it's a habit that we've got into. We're kind of in autopilot mode there. Uh, we kind of go about the conversation in the same way. And to be honest about it, most people are mentally sort of checked out. So what and that Ab organization did, go ahead, Rusty. It, it, no, and Abby, it, that really strikes home in, in two of those ways you're trying to, I know we're all sincere when we say, have a safe day, have a great day, but you're trying, how do you, yeah, how do you switch off that autopilot mode um, and get it beyond just checking the box. You're so right about those safety moments at the beginning of a meeting, and we all do them, certainly at Caterpillar as well, um, but it does become somewhat formal in terms of the programming and agenda. It's something we check the box on and move on. So you make a great point about how you really bring um, the sincerity to that, how you really try to break through the autopilot switch. It's a great point. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Before we jump into an exercise um, where we're all going to practice this a little bit, I want to tell you how the story ends with that organization yeah. uh, where I went and I discovered that the daily huddles were um, an important part of the day, but they weren't delivering the value that employees and certainly leaders really wanted from them. That organization actually gathered a group of frontline employees and said, you know what? You guys own this conversation that happens in the morning. This is really about creating a good platform for your day to be productive and to be safe. And so how about you help us understand the best way to go about this conversation? Now, you can imagine this team of employees was like, us? <laughs> but we said, yes, you. And, and we helped them build what they think works well in a daily huddle. And so not just what happens there as they have that conversation and what the content of that conversation is and the tone is, but also what they need from their supervisors and from their managers all the way up to their company president to make that system work well. And so as you can imagine today, a couple of years later, those daily huddles look very different than they did when I first had that conversation back a couple of years ago. And so that's the kind of involvement that I would love to see you all um, afford employees as you look to build better communication. So let's jump to that exercise now. And this is where we really start to think about what can we as individuals do? And so this one is one I call speaking of safety. And let's go ahead and look at the steps of the exercise. Now, um, if you have some pin, a pen and some paper with you, I encourage you to go ahead and write these things down. Uh, I would also encourage you to pop your comments into the comment section there on Facebook or YouTube because, hey, we can probably all learn from some of the ideas that you have. So we're gonna start with writing down one routine meeting that you have at work. And so this could be, for example, a daily huddle like those guys um, at the road construction company that I worked with have, or you know, maybe it's a week financials meeting. Now, the key here is it doesn't have to be a safety meeting. This can be any routine meeting or conversation that you have at work. This could even be when you're passing people in the hallway or you're meeting up at the coffee pot. Um, whatever it may be, just uh, write down one opportunity you have to communicate uh, while you're at work. And then I'd so like you to think about, oh, go ahead, Rusty. And Abby, I just want to think outside that formal meeting paradigm, mm -hmm. and certainly within Caterpillar and our manufacturing environments, you know, those supervisors, as you mentioned, do those daily walkthroughs to check on production. Uh, on the construction site, it may be that job site visit. Assume that this is the kind of communication you'd like us to consider as we sort of write down these different ways. I'm so glad you chimed in there. Those are perfect examples. If you are a supervisor and you have regular walkthroughs of the working environment, whether it's the manufacturing uh, shop floor or it's a job site, whatever it may be, an office environment, those are key opportunities to make connections with employees. Um, and so absolutely, Rusty, let's take those into account. In fact, that's really where I'd like, that's the type of example, a perfect example for this exercise. So thanks for guiding us through that. So write down um, one or three ways then that during these routine opportunities that you've that you've been uh, noting that you could engage who, whomever you're talking to in a positive valuable safety conversation what would the content of that look like so that's uh that's the the last piece of this puzzle so what are your opportunities where do they exist when do you have them and then how can you have an effective conversation? And I'm gonna give it just a moment here, just in case anybody is giving us some ideas potentially in some of those comment sections and see if anybody has any brave souls out there willing to share. <laughs> you're right, and I'm sure we'll, uh, absolutely. Uh, and, but you're right, I love the idea that it, it breaks through the formal meeting paradigm. And some of your best communication happens uh, maybe unplanned in some ways, an impromptu meeting, um, or you are a supervisor who comes across a, uh, an employee or a couple of employees um, who are engaged, and it's an opportunity. So it's that for me, it's probably not unlike some, how some are answering. It's, it's that weekly um, staff meeting, weekly editorial meeting, but then beyond that, um, so it sounds like 
really go out there and try to search for those new ways to communicate in this way. It's great. Yeah. Search for new ways to communicate um, through old forums, right? And so I always tell organizations that I work with, I'm not about putting additional meetings on your calendar. Nobody needs another meeting, right? right? No, I'm about thinking about what's already on your calendar and then maximizing those communication opportunities. So if you have a production meeting already on your calendar and you know, of course, you're going to talk about production. That's the title of the meeting. If safety isn't a regular component and topic during that discussion, why not add it in? It doesn't have to take over the agenda, but why not use that discussion that everybody already deems as important and use it as a platform to talk about safety? Now, let's go to the next slide, because if you if you were struggling to come up with good ideas, I have a few favorites for you that that I've seen work really well um, over the years and over my my work with organizations. And so I am going to give everybody a moment to read through these and I'm going to ask, you know, maybe Rusty be willing to weigh in here kind of what can we learn um, about our organization safety culture by the responses to these if we were to ask these questions. Well, what and, might and we Abby, learn other I, than the what obvious? What I love about this, you look at that one at the uh, at the bottom. Um, I'd like to share this recent inspection form, which was completed perfectly. It it turns that traditional safety conversation around. It, instead of pointing out something unsafe or an inspection that was done incorrectly, um, with this conversation, more proactive and positive. You're communicating um, what you what you do want, which is. Um, uh, uh, you know, as, a, as opposed to approaching it from, this is what you did wrong, here's what you're doing right. We've got a couple of comments that have come through. Um, Patrick Cusack on YouTube, I use site visits to, um, uh, to talk to workers and get with workers for this type of conversation. Uh, another comment, who best knows than the people who are on the ground? Um, and these are the types of, of questions that you can ask that are, that are positive and kind of get to the heart of that conversation. It's good. Yeah, I love that last one. In fact, I actually just got chills. It reminds me of another story um, and that, and this is a quick one, but uh, another organization I work with really got uh, heavily involved in involving employees in discussions about how to improve safety to the point where they had frontline employees sitting at a table on a regular basis with the top leadership in the organization. And probably one of the most powerful moments in communications that happened during one of the meetings that I observed is a, a decision point came up about changing something in a safety policy. And of course, the likely contributors jumped in, the safety director and the production manager and the president all had, you know, ideas and thoughts and maybe some concerns. And at one point, the president actually looked down to the table at uh, one of the frontline uh, members of the team that was there and said, what do you think? And I Imagine can tell you that, that turned yeah. her world around. That turned the, the organization around. The power of that question, a simple question, but pretty powerful. And it also, the other point, and this is sort of something we touched on last week with the psychology of safety, as a supervisor or a manager having an opportunity to talk with an employee, perhaps one-on-one, -on -one, um, it gives um, you the opportunity to ask them, how, how, yeah, how are you doing? Um, it gives you some insight into um, perhaps when we talk about mental health awareness and actually being able to read what may be happening with that employee, positive or negative. It's just a, you have to look for those opportunities, though, Abby. Absolutely. Yeah. And so hopefully today you're starting to think in that way. When do I have these opportunities and then how do I show up in the right way? Let's take a second to look at the top one. Who have you recognized recently for safety? This sets something of an expectation, does it not, for what we want in our safety culture? Because if I'm asked this, there is an assumption that somewhat recently I have recognized someone for safe behavior. Now, if that doesn't sound like something that would occur in your organization or in your safety culture, you know, maybe it's time to think about making a cultural shift. Um, but what we find when we start to shift to the positive, when we start to acknowledge that more, most behaviors that people commit each day are safe, 
correct behaviors, not unsafe or at risk behaviors, but safe behaviors, we realize we have a lot of good, positive things to comment about in safety if we just look for them. And then when we ask questions like this, we really drive that kind of culture where we are continually looking for the good things that people are doing. We're commenting on those things. And then we help others in our organization draw their attention to those good things as well. And, and by way of doing that, also some learning about where we're doing really well and how we might be able to apply those tactics uh, to other areas as well. And Abby, are we also not looking to for, you know, I always think personal uh, experiences to share, examples to share. Michael from Facebook um, shares a comment that we have a safety share before all meetings um, and it's always more meaningful when it comes from a personal experience. That's something you tend yes. to remember when, you, when yes. you put the personal to it a little bit. Absolutely. Most people can find some common ground with those personal stories. And so I always prefer that kind of approach, even if it means something you're bringing something from home or something that happened over the weekend. And so maybe it's not directly related to the task at hand that day, but safety doesn't just happen at work. We need to build our safety culture. The only way it really becomes a part of our culture is if we take it home with us at the end of the day as well. So I work with an organization that actually uses um, comments about at-home safety as a performance metric as they judge themselves on their safety performance, they look at how often comments about safety at home appear on their safety meeting forms. And they believe, and I agree, that that tells them something about the evolution of their safety culture. So let's take a poll now. I'm interested in engaging our audience a little further in understanding what you're experiencing as it relates here to these positive conversations around safety. We all know that when things go wrong, uh, when incidents occur, we are going to talk about safety. But again, most of the things that we do day in and day out are actually safe behaviors. And so there's ample opportunity to point out the positive as well. But I'd like to know from you, and you can utilize the comments section either in Facebook or YouTube or take the poll if you're joining us through Facebook. How often is something positive mentioned in your routine safety discussions? So consider this and give us an answer, A, B, C, or D, whether or not that happens um, always, frequently, rarely, or never. That's excellent. We'll see, we'll give it a minute here, Abby, and see what sure. starts to trickle in. Um, but it also strikes me too, um, and I suppose depending on the size of the group that you may manage, um, the number of people that you, you supervise, this is all conducive as well to as you get to know your employees um, and the relationships, the work relationships that you have with them. It, in my experience, it has tended when you have a group that uh, has worked together for a while, they, they, they uh, begin to know each other and they know, to your point, what, what's happening at home um, beyond work. It tends to go more positive that way when you're talking about those examples to, uh, and um, uh, things that you want to bring out. It, it tends to um, skew a little more positive versus negative as you um, know people. So I, again, like everything else, comes down to uh, relationships and, and knowing your people. Indeed. Uh, one of the number one drivers of a of culture of performance and safety is trust. And whether or not employees yep. trust that their management truly wants their them to be safe and wants them to return home each day. And how do you build trust? You can't build trust without communication. And so forging those connections that you've just talked about, Rusty, is pivotal. And the best way to do that is to have some kind of relatable conversation in which you can find some common ground. And I have seen this play out in so many organizations when they take and they create opportunities for employees and managers to and leaders to come together to, you know, even so even if it's a social event, they have a chance to meet one another, to understand and to get each other and to get a little glimpse inside the world of the other. You wouldn't believe how much more positive in nature everything goes from that point forward. Well, so I'm interested, are like we getting 60, any about, feedback about, yet on our about, poll? 
Oh, yeah, we do. About 60 percent, Abby, it looks like about 60 percent on Facebook are saying frequently, most on YouTube saying Excellent. frequently as well. So that, that's okay, a good sign. Okay, good. All right, so that tells me that we're in a good spot, but I'm sure everybody is on this webinar, webinar because we are interested in continuous improvement. We all want to drive toward that always. And so some people may be saying, well, what about those conversations when you have to correct someone's at-risk behavior? And I, my response to that is always, that's an opportunity to say something positive as well. Yes, of course we need to correct anything that might cause imminent danger. We want to do that, but there's no, nothing that says that we can't also point out something positive about what's going on in the scenario as well. All right, so let's move along now and to some tactical tips and tricks uh, that you can start implementing immediately, I think, to start driving some greater positivity into the communications and really leveraging your communications, uh, those routine opportunities you have to communicate um, to send a really great message about safety. And so let's go ahead and put all of those up on the screen at this point. And so what we're what we're doing is we're constantly constantly thinking about ways to infuse some positivity to acknowledge and recognize the good things we're doing in safety and maybe it's starting out the meeting by seeking some positive input and so this isn't always i'm here to share with you a positive point but it's me as the leader of the meeting asking who has something to share what good has happened this week on our job all right, uh, flipping the script on safety. And what I mean by that, and I stole this from another guy out at an organization that I work with that I just love. Um, and he said, you know what? We always talk about um, what goes wrong, what happened that we need to fix. And that's, that's a good thing that we do. We constantly wanna be learning and growing, uh, but let's flip that script and let's start off by what's going well. And what they've realized is that engages the group in um, a very positive way from the outset of the meeting. And yes, they go ahead and they take care of the problems at the same time, but it just puts everybody's brains in more of a point of collaboration and problem solving versus shutting people down because we've started off with a negative. All right, and so there are ample opportunities as we look at the last bullet point to build this into our performance metrics. And so everyday conversations are a way to constantly gauge our safety culture, gauge um, how people are involved in it. Um, and we can also build this into um, formal, uh, formal performance goals and targets as well for how often we're out there communicating, how often we're paying job site visits, how often we're walking the shop floor and what the content of those conversations is. So let's move along now into our next section. And this is really about communicating our vision. Again, I am making the assumption that everybody here today is here because you have a desire to improve your safety culture. Every organization I work with recognizes that communication is key to success. And really it starts with articulating the vision. And when I think about starting a journey, a safety journey, or continuing a safety journey by starting with the articulation of vision, I always think of that movie, Christmas Vacation, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And probably most of our viewers are familiar with that one um, by this point. Uh, but if not, um, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation um, is about a family uh, based in the Chicago area. And it starts out, the opening scene is something like this. Let's go to the next slide there and kind of show. So it's the family station wagon, wagon heading out to get the family's Christmas tree for the season. And a patriarch of the family, his name is Clark. He's articulating his vision for this Christmas season. And he's trying to rally his, his troops, his family, his wife and his two teenage kids to come along this journey with him to see what it is that he wants out of Christmas. And, and this is a Saturday morning and these kids are like, oh man, there's, I would, why do we have to be you know, going out here in the cold on a Saturday? They're moaning and they're groaning and they're passionate resistors, what we might call them, right? Uh, they're really against this effort, but he, that just um, enhances 
his selling of what this journey is all about and what his vision is for what he wants to achieve. And that is a good old fashioned family Christmas, right? And so he has certain expectations about what people, how people are going to act and what it's going to look like and feel like and what it means to have this type of holiday. And so he's really selling it and it really sets the stage for the rest of the movie. Now it's a comedy and it's a movie. So as you can imagine, and as maybe you've seen, there are a million missteps and miscommunications and there's some misbehavior along the way to maybe some bad attitudes as well. Uh, but it all comes around um, and it comes to a point where, yes, indeed, they come around to having kind of what they would consider maybe a good old fashioned family Christmas. And this is this is setting the vision early. So but the irony uh, with vision is that it is so, so very important to starting out a cultural journey but it is also one of the most common failure points. And so if we look at some of the work by John Cotter of the Harvard Business School, he studied hundreds of organizations that had gone through uh, culture change efforts. And he was looking for if something is going to go wrong, if this journey is going to go awry, or if we, are, if we, if we don't meet our intended outcomes, what would be the reason why? And what he honed in on are seven common failure points or pitfalls to culture change. And you can see there that two of them are related to vision. So there's establishing that vision early on, uh, but then that's just the first part. Number two is really driving it through your words and deeds. So let's go to the next slide and really drive this home. Do we communicate our vision powerfully and often, both in our words and our deeds? Now, I always want to bold that, um, that point from that previous slide because this is really what we're talking about. This is finding opportunities in our routines to have meaningful safety conversations and acknowledging that we as leaders, whether by title or by influence are constantly sending messages about what is important to us. So let's hone in here on words and deeds. Now there's some overlap, right? Sometimes we're doing both at once, um, but you know, some phrases like actions speak louder than words might uh, be coming to mind here as we look at this. Both our words and our actions um, send messages about what's important to us and our own level of commitment to safety. So one example I heard just yesterday in one of the organizations that I work with, is they talked about their senior leader coming out to the job site to pay, pay visits. And they said he always wears all of the correct PPE. And that sends a strong message without saying anything about it being important to him uh, that everybody wear the proper PPE. He is not sending the message that that's something that's important for field operations folks, but not for me as a leader. He's supporting that message. Uh, I also heard another story about another leader in that organization who chips in on housekeeping tasks from time to time around the plant when he makes his visits. So he is not above um, picking up a uh, cable that's run, you know, across the walkway or something like that and chipping in. And so these are these are deeds. Again, this is outside of what you might think about in terms of traditional communications, but these are sending powerful messages that I think are even more influential than the uh, stump speeches <laughs> that might be done. And, now, those and, those. Go ahead, Russ. Did you want to jump in? And Abby, it, no. It, it, as it, it's a great time to remind people that yeah, whether you're a manager, a supervisor, um, you are the CEO. You you always realize and, and you the power of of influence someone's always watching someone's always listening someone's always observing um how you're handling the situation and um uh, when it comes to safety that's that's no different and it's, it's just as powerful certainly and having that vision and have people follow that vision Absolutely. And so think about those opportunities that we keep coming back to your routine communications, your routine um, outings that you have throughout the workforce, and think about those as being regular opportunities to advance your vision. 
okay? So this is gonna lead us right into another exercise. So if you have a pen and some paper, get that out again. If you wanna throw your thoughts into the comments section on Facebook or YouTube, even better. Let's take a look at this next exercise that's, that's called living your vision. And let's, let's think about what is your vision for safety? in your organization, whether this is something that's already established or something that's just in your heart, in your mind about what you want for your organization. And, and Abby, I might jump in to ask, you mm -hmm. know, with most organizations, certainly large organizations, we hope have a safety slogan or a tagline at Caterpillar. Yes. Of course, ours is safely home, everyone, every day. It, so I assume that's what you mean by vision or is it something more specific, uh, like how people interact how safety is measured or the way you approach a safety strategy? I'm going to say yes to all of those things. So <laughs> if you want to take your organization's safety vision, like safely home, everyone, every day, or zero by choice, or whatever it may be, go ahead and talk. And what I want you to think about is what that means to you. And maybe you're not connected to your organization's safety vision. Maybe that's not something that you feel viscerally strongly about. And if that's the case, that's fine. Think about what it is that you would like to see for your organization and write that one down. And then once you have that, write down, let's say one to three ways. I know we're already at 40 minutes past the hour here. So yeah, one to yeah. three ways colleagues can contribute to achieving and sustaining that vision. So what do you think others ought to be doing to achieve this vision? What would you like to see from others? Okay, so if those are the expectations that you have, that drives us to number three. And that is, what are three opportunities, again, maybe one to three opportunities that you have to motivate or reinforce those actions through your words and deeds? So it's one thing to have a glorious vision of where you want your organization to go, but it's another thing to take action to help everyone get there. And so that's where we're headed with this exercise. That's great. And I think, Abby, as we um, we want to make sure we work in all of the, uh, uh, the great slides and information as we go. Mm -hmm. So um, we may not necessarily share um, uh, all of these, but for, for yourself, as you put together a plan, if you don't have one or perhaps you want to enhance what you already have in place. This is great because you're right. It all starts with the vision. Right. And as you said, these slides will be available to everyone afterwards. So let's go ahead and keep moving. We can always come back to this in the recording. So one thing to consider here is that simply hearing great words does not compel great behavior. And I always think of an organization I work with that does a quarterly safety video from the president. And he sends very good, uh, solid, well-intentioned messages about safety in all of those. But it really wasn't until he created opportunities to communicate directly with frontline employees and created opportunities to be there, you know, face to face with them and talk with them about their ideas that they really felt felt his commitment to safety. And so I challenge you um, not just to not just think about those, I guess, common traditional forms of communication that we have, newsletters and quarterly updates and things like that, but think about how to make your communications and your opportunities more sincere. All right, let's keep moving right along here. Now here's another exercise that will really help you kind of hone in on your vision and what's important. And I'm gonna do a quick introduction of this exercise and then ask that maybe you um, come back to it afterwards so that we can keep going through the rest of the presentation. Sure. But what we want here is for you to take a list one through five of what's important to you in your uh, business. And then I want you to put um, the, the work boots on of a frontline employee in your organization or uh, whatever type of work attire, a frontline sort of, you know, maybe hourly work in your organization might wear. And I want you to make that another list of one through five of what that person thinks is probably likely to think is most important to the organization. And then I want you to compare those lists. And often what we find is that maybe we have the same list of five things that are most important, but they're in very different order. And so that really comes down to what we talk about most often. Because let's go to the next slide. Here is, here is where uh, we realize that it's our words and deeds. What we're saying and what we're doing is what shows people what's 
important to us. OK, so think about your list. Think back on your list and think what opportunities do I have to communicate about those things that are most important so that as I consider that list that comes from the frontline employee, they start to match up and they start to see that what is important to me is what they're focused on as well. Let's go to the next slide. Again, what you say and what you do day in and day out, those words and deeds, that's telling others what's most important to you. Next slide. Our beliefs are shaped by the experiences that we have and at work, don't we all want to focus on what we believe is most important to our boss and maybe even on what we see as recognized. And so as it relates to safety, if we see somebody taking a bunch of shortcuts, committing a bunch of at risk behaviors to get a job done quickly, and then they are commended for getting that job quickly, what kind of message does that send to us? And might we be influenced to take some shortcuts because we see that that kind of behavior is recognized. Now, the flip side of that is, what if we have a, a colleague who submits a near miss report and then they are commended for doing that? That might send us a message that that send that filling out near miss reports and submitting those is important to the organization that we want to learn from those things. Let's take a look at how all of this communication that we've just kind of set up and talked about here relates to safety performance. That's our next section here. What we know statistically is that 90 plus percent of incidents occur due to some kind of action, some kind of at-risk behavior, not because of a condition, okay? So as we take that stat and we move forward into a model that shows us why incidents happen, how incidents are connected to the culture, we realize that we set the tone for the types of behaviors that we want and ultimately the kind of safety performance that we will get through our communication. Let's move on to the next slide. That's that model that's showing us how incidents happen. All right, so an incident is driven by an at-risk behavior. Why would we commit an at-risk behavior? Probably because we have some attitude that we won't get hurt or it's gonna be fine. Maybe we've done it a million times before and we've never been hurt, so what's one more time? Texting and driving is a really good example of this, right? All right, so those attitudes, um, beliefs and ideas are shaped by communication norms. These are our words and our deeds. These are our reactions when people do certain things, right? And so we submit a near miss report and we get commended for doing that. That's going to drive more behavior of submitting near miss reports. And ultimately over time, these norms shape our culture. Abby, if, if I could yeah. ask a question, have Jump you in. ever talked to someone, has anyone ever told you, uh, an employee say to you, but I feel like uh, my supervisor, my leader uh, wants me to take a risk if it means getting the job done. They want me to, um, mm -hmm. if, it, if it means being unsafe for a short time to get the work done, do it. Does that, have you, has someone ever said that to you? I hear that almost weekly, in fact. And wow. so that's why I honestly, that's why I have a job <laughs> because yeah, yeah, that I, exists right. I mean, so much. And so what we then do is we talk to the leaders about the messages they send. And so where you have a supervisor who would say, well, I would never tell someone to hurry. We say, OK, well, what did you tell them? Well, we talked about the dead, the tight deadline that we're on. OK, so what do you suppose the message is to the employee? We better hurry and hurry means right. that shortcut maybe i might infer that just by as you described exactly that. exactly so we really have to think about uh what we're saying how we're presenting the information and what the resulting message could be and are we driving the kind of behavior that we want or are we somehow incentivizing at-risk behavior so it takes a lot of um, intuitive digging, right? And, and, and understanding kind of what's behind our words and what kind of messages are they sending? That's a great question. Let's move on uh, to the next slide here. 
So like we said, our words, and you just drove home that point beautifully, Rusty, our words shape perceptions. Our deeds also shape perceptions, those um, actions. So the leader that took the time to do a little housekeeping while he was on site sends a perception that safety is not just for me, safety is for everyone in this organization and everyone's going to chip in. And the thing about this is perceptions endure over time. And so you may um, know about, there may be legends in your organization about managers who were harsh disciplinarians. And I bet if you're a leader, you're still dealing maybe with some of the fallout from those perceptions uh, that might exist among the workforce that, um, you know, we don't, of how we respond when someone gets injured or how we respond when there's a near miss. So as a leader, you have to be aware of and seek out what are the per perceptions that are out there and what might I need to do to set the tone appropriately for today's culture. So perceptions then form attitudes, beliefs, and ideas. And these are attitudes, beliefs, and ideas about what's expected of me, also what's acceptable. Is it acceptable that I take off my gloves when it's hot outside, even though this work is inherently dangerous? Well, if I've seen other people do it and I've seen supervisors turn a blind eye, I might have the perception that that's acceptable. <laughs> um, and also what's rewarded. So commending an employee for uh, stopping work and when something looks unsafe and having um, a quick safety discussion with the team before you get back to work, if you take the time to commend that employee, to acknowledge that that was a good action, whether or not it set production back or not, uh, that sends a strong signal to the rest of the workforce that that's the kind of culture you want. And if you can do so in an appropriate way of recognizing that employee in a way that's, that's somewhat public, then others will start to take notice as well and, and realize that they are expected to do those kinds of things as well. And attitudes, beliefs, and ideas drive our behaviors, especially when no one else is around. Everybody's going to be safe when the boss is on site, right? But what really dictates your culture is what happens when nobody's looking. And this goes back to the example about people bringing ideas from home. And you might find yourself as your organization advances along its safety journey, you taking those things home. I know I behave in different ways today than I did 10 years ago before I got into this business just because it's influenced me so significantly. So let's take a look at some tips and tricks to really bring us home here and apply what we've just reviewed into some tactics. So I would encourage you to review your vision message messaging frequently, if, whether that's your company vision or that's your own vision, because if you are familiar with what it is that you want, then you are in a better position to communicate, to support it and to advance it. Take that important to me list that you created and post it in your office or somewhere that's highly visible to you so that as you're having those routine communications through your day, you're reinforcing those things that are important. Because again, what you talk about most often and most frequently is likely to be what others believe to be most important to you. And then finally, find ways to really live your words. So if you are saying safety is important, if you are saying that everyone needs to wear proper PPE, then by all means, do the same for yourself. Live out that vision. And so now with just a few minutes left to spare, I'd love to open it up here and get some ideas and thoughts from everybody and just hear what you have to say and maybe what ideas you can share with the rest of us for how we can all communicate more effectively through our words and deeds. Abs absolutely. Uh, any comments, questions that uh, come through? We do have a few minutes left. One thing strikes me, Abby, uh, that you mentioned in that process of, of establishing that communication plan. Um, and one of the, the pitfalls could be declaring victory too soon. Um, Indeed, which maybe we've all been ex have experienced uh, mm -hmm. in in our particular situation. Uh, but I assume an example of that might be uh, put up a poster, put up a sign, yeah. all with all right. the right safety messages. Done. Yeah. 
Right. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're, you're speaking my language right now. So we've all seen the safety first, right? Uh, posters and that kind of thing. And, and so the old adage goes when you ask an employee in, in, in a factory or factory setting, yeah. So is safety important around here? And they point to the wall and say, yeah, you see the poster over there. It says safety's first. <laughs> and then they say, well, let me tell you how it really is. And so, um, and when it comes to communication strategy, I am all about using multiple mechanisms, multiple channels. And sometimes that's a poster, right? Especially if you get your employees involved in establishing what your vision for safety is, by all means, let's broadcast that. Let's put it on all kinds of posters and things like that to reinforce that message. But let's also be aware that the more impactful communications that are truly going to have an influence on our culture are those conversations that we have, are that is that relationship building that again builds the trust that we need in order to have safe performance. And, and Abby, Harry on uh, Facebook uh, has a question asking if you might be able to provide an example or some examples of actions uh, that help prevent accidents. And thanks for the question, Harry. I will always turn that question around and say, anytime you as a leader can ask the employee what their thoughts are on the safest way to go about this particular job or task, then that will be a very impactful conversation um, that will give you insight into what not only what's happening, but get their ideas about how it could be done safely. You're gonna learn what they're doing today what their thoughts are on the safest way. And then if you have ideas, you can chime those in as well. But I'm always going to turn it into a conversation versus just giving information. Thanks for the question. No, that's it. Yeah, it, it is uh, a great question. Absolutely. Another one uh, asks, can you tell me, Abby, some examples of frontline employees uh, taking a leadership role in safety? Oh my goodness, I have so many examples. Okay, it'll take me just a minute here, but I wanna share one. And so I, I mentioned briefly back in another slide about stop work authority. Every organization I've ever worked with says that employees have stop work authority, meaning if they see a situation that they believe is unsafe or someone is at risk, they have the authority to stop work, to find a safer way and then move forward probably 80 to 90 percent of those organizations when i ask employees would you ever actually do that they'll say yeah i might but i'm probably going to get my hand slapped for slowing down production so again it goes back to the culture but as far as an employee getting involved i have an organization that i work with that about six months um, to eight months into trying to make a cultural shift and saying you know as, 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 with their words saying this is what we want from you we want every employee to be accountable we want employees to to stop work if necessary they had an hourly worker um courageously shut down an operation that was on a tight deadline because there was imminent danger. He shut it down, he gathered the team, they had a 10 minute safety conversation, they agreed on a new, better, safer way to go about the operation and that operation uh, commenced safely and actually did meet the deadline. But the biggest um, part of this story is that that um, story was shared all the way up with the company president who wrote a handwritten thank you note to that employee, sent it to his home to recognize the fact that he is living out their vision for safety. Yeah. That's my that's a, what, latest favorite story. That's a powerful, no, what a powerful example. And here's a question that I, I was thinking about. Mark on Facebook um, takes this sort of out of, off the job site, out of the production facility, uh, and asks uh, Abby, any ideas on how to emphasize safety um, in a non-industrial setting, uh, in the office? Um, mm -hmm. Still safety, but maybe in a little bit of a different way. 
Yeah, well, Mark might know and many joining us that slips, trips and falls continue to be one of the number one drivers of incidents and injuries in workplaces. And those things happen in office environments as well. And so all of the organizations I work with, um, you might guess, are tend to be industrial in nature, but we touch the office environments as well. So almost every safety process that we build that uh, it applies not only to the outside workforce, but also the office environment. Now, with some flexibility for those things to work appropriately. So daily huddles that you commonly see construction crews doing can happen in an office environment as well. Maybe they don't need to happen every single day. Maybe it's a weekly huddle, but we're still having routine conversations about safety and the hazards, whatever they may be in the office environment. And there are those hazards, but something really relevant to the people in that setting. Yeah, great examples, uh, great advice. Um, Abby, as always, I hate it that time goes so quickly. It doesn't matter whether we're so in the room fast. together or whether we're virtual, social distancing, the time always goes so fast. These are important conversations. Um, want to thank you so much for sharing examples and stories and tips and tricks today and, and, and frankly teaching us. So we really appreciate you being here. Well, thank you so much. And thanks especially to those folks for adding comments. I can't wait to go through them because I'm sure you've given me some ideas as well and some that I can continue to share out with the organizations we work with. And, and Abby, if someone wants to uh, reach out and have uh, extend that conversation and talk about a little more specific to their a company, their business, what, sh what should they do? Yeah, so we have a post event survey and there is a QR code there for you to scan. That's the best way you can give us some feedback on the event and that will connect you directly to our team as well, to Caterpillar Safety Services. And I welcome you as well to contact me directly. There, my email address is right there. I'm also out on LinkedIn. So I hope to have a lot of friends after this event. You already had a lot of friends coming into this. So you're gonna make a lot more, I think, after today's conversation. Abby, look forward to seeing you uh, again and, and talking soon. We really do appreciate it. The, the next live webinar session uh, is next week, same time, same place in essence, uh, and we will be focused on demonstrating commitment. So taking safety from uh, the office out to the front line on the construction job site, out at that production facility. Please don't miss this session. Um, it is going to be... Uh, uh, very insightful, very helpful. Uh, and we want you to always come away from these webinars with some tangible to-dos, uh, actions that you can take to improve or transform your company or organization's safety culture. Again, you can get uh, this presentation and more information anytime. Just go to cat.com slash safety leadership, cat.com slash safety leadership. All right, we are about out of time. I'm Rusty Dunn on behalf of Caterpillar and Caterpillar Safety Services. Until next time, take care, stay safe, we'll talk soon.